Failing banks could bail in your money. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Still working through that morning shine of coffee and I thought we'd have a look at this article from News for ABC News at the moment, written by Nassim Kadem, discussing, well, the ambiguous laws around bank deposit bail-ins. Now, Martin North, John Adams and the CEC are drawing, bringing everyone's attention to, among other things, the bail-in risk that presents us here in Australia. What a lot of people don't realize is that your money that you deposit into the bank, well, it's not really your money anymore, it's an unsecured loan to the bank. So if the bank goes under, well, you could be in trouble. And of course, the government guarantees that money. Don't worry, it's all safe, it's all good. But there is an element, an element of risk where your money could be bailed in. Now, this has happened before. And it's, everyone remembers what happened in Cyprus. You know, but, you know, Cyprus, it's not the same as Australia. Could it happen here in Australia? That's the question. Over there, people, uh, pensioners and people who'd invested money, just, you know, they woke up one morning and boom, it's gone. And they had these wonderful shares in the bank. What do you th how much do you think they were worth? What does this do to people's confidence? So let's have a look at this article. Imagine you woke up one day to find your bank account had been wiped out. Your entire life savings had evaporated overnight, but not because some anonymous fraudster had stolen it. It happened because the very banking institutions that regulators have repeatedly told you is unquestionably strong has faltered. And I would say, I would say this is also playing into why so many people have withdrawn their super money. Given the opportunity, they wanted it in their own hands and to riddle it away on whatever they want because they have no confidence in the financial system. Can you blame them? Can you blame them? The bank has taken your deposit and converted it into shares to ensure its own survival. You now, now own those shares, but you've taken on more risk than you signed up for, and there's a possibility those shares could end up being worthless. And you probably, you know, they're probably even locked away that you can't even use those shares or sell those shares or liquefy them straight away, maybe for a period, a year or two. You know? That is the scenario of a bank moving to bail in your money. If you think that's this, uh, to this is totally impossible, think again. It happened in Cyprus not so long ago. While a bail-in situation in Australia is currently a highly improbable scenario, people are feeling more nervous about their financial future amid the pandemic crisis and deepest recession since the Depression. Now, strategies for minimizing this risk, I know Martin North has talked about it in some of his videos about because there's bank guarantees from the government depending on institutions, but you know, you've got multiple institutions covered by the same one. So the strategy is to to spread out your resources. And I'd point you to some of his videos to have a look at where he discusses that. A Senate inquiry is now being asked to consider whether there is a need to tighten up a perceived legislative loophole that could give the nation's banking regulator, the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority, the power to implement authorized or direct bail-in to deposits. I mean, there you go. Would you want that? I mean, here we, here we go. If this was publicly, if you know, people were made aware of this, and then there was another bank, another one coming onto the scene saying, you know, we will pay you low interest rates, you know, but we will not bail in your money. You know, we're just simply a deposit holding and, and we lend on low risk products. Would you move your money to that? Would that fill you with confidence? So is Australia at risk of an imminent bail-in? Before understanding the history behind the current Senate inquiry, it is worth noting Australian banks are not in the same boat as the Cyprus, Cyprus banks were in 2013. Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. Our banks are still well, well capitalized and profitable and are being supported by regulators throughout the crisis. Furthermore, should their situation deteriorate because of the pandemic, the federal government has repeatedly vowed it will protect Australians' bank deposits. Under the financial claim scheme, Australians' savings with authorized deposit-taking institutions, ADIs, are guaranteed for deposits of up to 250000 per institution. If someone has two different accounts with the same bank, even if under, under different brands, the limit applies. So, so there you go, you're capped at two fifty. So you need to find, 
you need to find several different uh, banks that are not the same brand, so not the same ownership, to split up your money, which probably isn't isn't a silly thing to do anyway, particularly to separate your your uh, business banking and your personal banking. There's the all money's clause where banks can just take all your money and just squish it together to, to solve their problems. This deposit guarantee effectively commits the government to the opposite of a bail-in. It is a bail-out. It is, a, it is also a highly pol uh, political unpalatable and therefore extremely unlikely that APRA would move to direct banks to bail in people's deposits. Yeah, I mean, that would be insane. Could, could you imagine... If any political party were in power when this happened, they would never get in again. They would ne So what would happen is, say, say if there was a risk, they would do everything they could to kick the can down the road for the next lot, you know, the next mob to get in. Guaranteed, that's what they'd try and do. After all, a core part of APRA's mandate is to protect the interests of depositors, policyholders, and superannuation fund members. And as the Cyprus case showed, Retaining the confidence of retail depositors during a crisis is crucial to avoiding wider financial contagion. Nevertheless, the mortgage loan books of Australia's lenders has risen to almost two trillion. And as many economic commentators and the IMF have warned for years, if property values suddenly plummet, that could it could turn into a huge liability and pose a risk to banks and the wider financial system. Well, isn't that why? Isn't that why the banks no longer have to revalue their holdings? They've kind of got a holiday from that. I wonder why they did that. I wonder how a law change could explicitly prevent bail-ins. So, how did the Senate inquiry come about, and what is it examining? One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts has introduced a proposed law change called the Banking Amendments Deposit Bill 2020, which was a which was referenced to the Senate Economic Legislation Committee in June. In his words, the bill st stops failed banks taking our money. The fear about legislative loopholes initially surfaced following the GFC when a number of concerned individuals with links to the far-right political party CEC started writing letters to their local MPs. Well, I mean, it's justified. Look at what happened in the U.S., guys. The party is accused of being affiliated with the International LaRoche Movement, which was led by the American political activist Lyndon LaRoche, who, whose critics describes as a political cult and promotes conspiracy theories and anti-Semitism. Okay, well, you can look into the CEC for all of this, and this seems to be the standard boilerplate whenever they, they discuss the CEC, but the issue is... The issue is, uh, if there is a potential risk for banks bailing in, which we've seen has happened overseas, what would it hurt to have some legislation? And I've I've read the bill, the proposed amendment that Senator Malcolm Roberts is putting forward, and I'll link to that video up here. I'm just looking at my, my time stance. I'll link to it up here. What he's talking of doing is not, or what he's suggesting in this bill isn't that, isn't that drastic, everyone. If it's not going to happen, it won't hurt. This is, this is a, a change which would protect deposits, cost nothing, cost absolutely nothing. I mean, the politicians are sitting there anyway. Why not? Why not? The CEC, including its research director, uh, Robert Barwick, were asking for changes to the law that enshrined that their deposits are in fact safe following legislation known as the Financial Sector Legislation Amendment, Crisis Resolution Powers and Other Measures Bill 2017. This legislation gave APRA the power to allow a bail-in financial instrument known as hybrid securities, a financial instrument described at the time by the former ASIC chairman, Greg Medcraft, as a ticking time bomb. So here's the thing. Notice this. They're attempting to, in this article, they're attempting to frame the CEC in a particular ideological way and linking them to certain things that even if they have an idea that is sensible, uh, you, it'll discredit it. And you'll find this happens a lot in the media and you find this happens a lot just with how they're putting things forward. You know. Around that time, the Senate Standing Committee on Economics, which was chaired by Senator Jane Hume, examined the law surrounding bail-in of hybrid securities. It said it did not consider that the bill would allow the bail-ins of Australian savings and deposits since depositors are protected by both the FCS and under the Banking Act. The legislation passed in 2018. 
Now, fast forward to 2020, with fears of a financial meltdown heightened as Australians lose their jobs, JobKeeper payments are about to taper off, and bank loan repayment holidays are coming to an end. I mean, just think about this. The, I mean, the banks are giving so many people holidays on their mortgages. I, I wouldn't have even thought it would have been possible. You know, but that just shows you how, how naive I am, you know, expecting people having to pay their debts. The Senate has already been hit with about 200 submissions, mostly from self-funded retirees and older Australians who have accumulated life savings and therefore have large deposits in the bank. These submissions all run along a similar theme, the need to remove all legis- legislative uncertainty to stop the leg- uh, legislative theft of bank deposit savings. For these citizens, in the aftermath of the Banking Royal Commission, uh, verbal assurances from APRA and the Reserve Bank of Australia and political leaders just aren't enough. Well, yeah, that's right. They said if the government and regulators are serious about protecting people's deposits, there should be no ambiguity in the law. They want the Banking Act amended. And the amendment that they're asking for isn't that big a deal. You know? Those who argue the law is ambiguous rely on one legal opinion. So is the current legislation ambiguous? Most of the individual submissions that argue the law is vague and are in support of the bill passing rely on one legal opinion, that of Robert H. Butler, a solicitor from Chatsworth in Sydney and member of the CEC. Mr. Butler points out two problems with the existing laws. First, he says that the 2018 Act that allows bail-ins of hybrid securities in referring to them, also uses the word and other instruments without defining what this means. Mr. Butler argues that bank deposits could be other instruments. He acknowledges that the government has contended that these words do not extend to deposits, but said the reference to any other instrument would be unnecessary if the power only applied to instruments with conventions or write-off provisions, or conversion or write-off provisions. Bloody lawyers. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> secondly mr butler argues that even if the words any other instruments don't encompass deposits the bank themselves could change certain terms and conditions and draw on the deposits the specifics of the powers vary from bank to bank but each fundamental each fundamentally contains such a power mr butler said the treasury say the bill is unnecessary Treasury and the Australian Banking Association have swiftly rejected the argument that the law is ambiguous. Treasury says in its submission that the bill uh, that it considers the bill to be unnecessary. It says that there are currently two explicit legislative provisions in the Banking Act specifically directed to protecting deposits. First, Section 13A3 of the Banking Act provides for priority repayments of protected accounts, including deposit accounts, within the meaning of the bill. It is unlikely even that the ADI were unable to meet its obligations. Sorry, in the unlikely event that an ADI, Australian Deposit Authorised Deposit Institution, were unable to meet its obligations, it said. Second, Part 2, Division 2AA of the Banking Act establishes the FCS. The FCF guarantees protected accounts, including deposit accounts within the meaning of the bill, up to a cap of 250000 per account holder, per ADI. Treasury also says the reference to other instruments relates to the theoretical possibility of APRA recognizing other classes of capital investments in the future. Import- importantly, the reference to other instruments could never uh, relevantly apply to deposit accounts because the contractual terms of deposit accounts invariably provides for full repayment of principal and interest subject to fees. So ax banking lobbyists say deposits should be up for grabs. That they should be up for grabs. So I'm going to keep going with the coffee here. It really, all of this really just makes you want to turn into a prepper. You know, get a little mountain mountain bunker with your, with your piles of gold and silver and US dollars. Interesting, or maybe I've just been playing too much Far Cry 5. Interestingly, some argue that bill should be changed to do the exact, exact opposite. The Banking Act should make it explicit that bank deposits are at some risk of write-off or conversion to shares. Nick Hozak, a public policy consultant, former director of the Australian Banking Association and former advisor to John Howard, is making that argument. 
If legal clarity is the goal, then it will be better for market discipline of banks to be clear in the legislation that depositors do face some risk of write-off or conversion to shares, his submission states. Well, wouldn't you rather that? If there's the risk of it happening, he makes a good point there. I may not, you know, I may not want that to happen, but if there's that risk, don't you want to be made aware of it? And then what demands would you put on the bank if you're at that risk? Mr. Hosek argues bank shareholders and executives have financial incentives to take levels of lending risk that exceeds the socially optimal level of risk. The bill, in effect, shifts back bank lending risk back onto taxpayers, he said. With smaller banks, there was a feasibility option of government authorities allowing a failure and putting the bank through an insolvency process where there is at least some risk that depositors will lose money. But allowing a failure of big banks was not a realistic option. So could banks change terms and conditions against depositors? Martin North from the research firm Digital Finance Analytics, together with former liberal economics advisor John Adams, has been making regular YouTube videos on the possibilities of bail-ins. Both North and Adams argue in separate submissions that big banks have already changed their terms in the last in the past few years. For example, one bank states that we may give you a shorter notice period or no notice of an unfavorable change if we believe doing so is necessary for us to avoid or reduce a material increase in our credit risk or our loss. This, both North and Adams argue, allows the banks to, without notice, change conditions of those accounts to potentially active deposit bail-in, uh, sorry, activate deposit bail-in at the request of the regulators, essentially a bail-in. We have the view the regulator APRA prefers the current ambiguity as it provides greater flexibility in a crisis, but we believe this needs to be removed, Mr. North said. He added that a bail-in is something that would occur before a bank fails, and so government deposit guarantees of 250000 per institution and customer would not be activated. And this is the point that North and Adams seem to make over and over again, that the risk, you know, that the bank didn't fail. So the government doesn't need to pay you your money. So why global regulators support the bail-in? The possibility of a bail-in in Australia needs to be viewed in a wider global context. Following the 2018, uh, 2008 financial crisis, international regulators have consistently argued that governments need to have clear policies of, on bail-in. These policies don't necessarily relate to deposits, but wider financial instruments designed to be converted into shares in the event of a crisis. Firstly, the 2019 IMF Financial System Stability Report calls on authorities to introduce a statutory bail-in regime based on best international practice. Do you love it that there's best international practice for bail-in? Yeah. Secondly, the G20-backed Financial Stability Board which is charged with monitoring and assessing vulnerabilities affecting the global financial system, recently released a report evaluating the too-big-to-fail banking reforms. The report suggests governments must have the powers, the information, and the incentives to move from bailout to bail-in. It explicitly states that this would involve giving authorities, in Australia's case, APRA, independent legal power to resolve a banking crisis without the consent of the banks, shareholders, and their customers. While the IMF does not define what best international practice looks like, Mr. North and Mr. Adams noted in their submissions that international examples of statutory bail-in do already exist in New Zealand, the European Union, US and Canada. So transparency is key in, uncertain, in an uncertain world. Well, here's the thing. I mean, what's the difference between a bail-in and a bail-out? Think about it. Bail-in, they instantly take your money. Bail-out, the government gives them money and then taxes you to take it later. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> in some ways, it's just, you know, do you want to feel the sting more directly, guys? Because this is what happens when the government is intervening in the market, bailing out businesses, supporting businesses. It's the same thing. It's almost if if we had every time the government did a new scheme, you know, OK, JobKeeper's announced. OK, to fund JobKeeper, we're taking $5,000 out of everyone's bank account. Do you think that would happen? You know, maybe, maybe we should try that for a change. We need bail-ins for every time the government does a new harebrained scheme or bail, you know, incentive or picks a winner in the market. So transparency is key in an uncertain world. In a world where financial risks are heightened, regulators and political leaders need to be transparent. 
Just days ago, Chairman of the Financial Stability Board, Ronald K. Puales, delivered a speech warning that while too big to fail, banking reforms have strengthened the global financial system since 2008 crisis, regulators should improve how they deal with the possibilities of distressed banks. He did not specifically mention bail-in, but noted in the aftermath of the pandemic, all FSB members made up of 24 central banks, including the Reserve Bank of Australia, need to consider how to improve their resolution capabilities so they are fully prepared to respond to a banking failure or a crisis. This global discussion about bail-in policies coincides with the federal government's proposal to introduce laws that would ban cash transactions above $10,000, and make it a criminal offence to use cash for most transactions above that limit. It also comes at a time when there's been evidence of wealthier Australians pulling large sums of cash out of their bank accounts. The inquiry is due to report back in early August. It may well find that there's no institutional risk of a bail-in in Australia. That being the case, the perception that there is legal ambiguity could be further tested if the inquiry holds public hearings that include the views of others, including independent legal experts. Politically, it is likely the government will remain reluctant to change the law to more clearly state there will not be bail-ins. Such a move would send a signal to the wider community that it feels there could that there is a risk and that it might spook, spook the public into a bank run, which a large number of people rush to pull out their deposits. Yes, that's... Now, Sims got it on the money there. Got it on the money there. Even, even changing it to provide more clarity would will, will scare the hell out of people. How many of you, if you heard that, would go to the bank and get your money out? <laughs> How many of you would? I mean, we saw what happens when, when people, you know, when sis- digital systems go down and people don't have cash. How many people have a bit of cash just stashed aside just in case? So, but depositors, but depositors need to be provided with clear information so that they are aware of the risks they face in the event that a worst case scenario eventuates. Only then can we make informed decisions about what they do with their money. Well, there you have it. A quite a long and thorough article. That's, uh, <laughs> I'm pretty tired going through that one. Written by Nassim looking at, well, the bank bail-ins that's doing the rounds. I think a lot of people just... Well, frankly, they probably don't have enough money to care about it. Or a lot of people aren't even worried about it. How many people didn't even realize? Have you spoken to them? Aren't even aware there's the $10,000 cash spending limit going about. So it's good that it's getting some exposure. It's good that articles are being written about it and people are discussing it. And I mean, frankly, it's good that One Nation are putting forward amendments to give us more clarity. I think that's fantastic. Let me know, guys. Are you concerned about a bank bail-in? Do you remember what happened in Cyprus? What have you done to mitigate your risk? As always, let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. If there is a risk of bank bail-in, do you think people will just start flooding the property market? Maybe maybe they'll do that. Maybe they'll do that. They'll say, oh, well, you might as well buy houses. You know, bail-in risk. Hey, they're spending more than ever in history. Why not? Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. If you're a fan and want to support the content I'm creating here, there are a few ways you can. You can join us on YouTube or Patreon. You can support us using our affiliate links at Amazon, eBay, Independent Reserve, or KuCoin. You can buy a merch from Heiser Says. You can use Gold Pass from the Perth Mint or support us via PayPal. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you next time.